and we got a killer on our own. Two individuals commit a robbery and a murder. The one who does the stabbing and commits the murder gets a life sentence. Who it is said planned the whole thing and helped It's time to take a long look at this and find out why there was two different punishments handed down. I'm your host, Bill Swafford, and this is Murderers in Ohio. I'm going to make this into two parts. There's a lot to talk about. It has taken me longer than usual to put all of this together. I do want to keep the episodes for Murderers in Ohio around 30 minutes. I believe that this case is going to take a lot longer than that. Now, if you are listening and would like to eventually see and hear longer episodes for Murderers in Ohio, then you can find me on Twitter or email me to let me know. And you can find out how to contact me in the episode description. And if you like the episodes you hear, please like and share them with others. Then make sure that you hit the subscribe button if you already haven't done so. This will help Murderers in Ohio. So let's talk about what we all come here to the Buckeye State to listen to. This is a case of robbery, murder, and deception of a friend. This episode of Murderers in Ohio, I'm going to talk about a case that has received a lot of media attention. wasn't about the crime itself, but that has got a lot of attention. Over the punishments that was handed down to the two individuals that committed the crime. One person got a life sentence, and the other was sentenced to death. Now, there have been cases where multiple suspects have been involved, and different sentences were handed down, although most of the actual murder gets the tougher sentence. While looking into this and getting things prepared, I wondered if a person's age should be taken into consideration in trial when a death sentence is on the line. This made me wonder what all would put the death sentence on the table in the state of Ohio. I did look into some of that, and I will talk more about what qualifies for the death sentence later on. In this episode, I'm going to talk about several different towns and several different counties in Ohio. I believe out of all the episodes I've done so far, this case involves the most towns and counties out of all the episodes. I think it would be best that I start off with Waynesville, Ohio, which is in Warren County. Warren County is south of Montgomery County and is east of Butler County. Waynesville, Ohio is a small community near Caesars Creek State Park. Waynesville is actually too small to be a town. It's considered to be a village with only around 3,000 residents. Waynesville is known for its sauerkraut festival. After the events of January 28, 2014, and the trial that followed, Waynesville would be known for a robbery and a murder that will push people to look at Ohio's laws and punishment for those who commit murder, and have a family fighting for stricter punishments for murderers in Ohio. Mark and Sandy Cates lived in Waynesville with their two kids, one of them we're not going to talk about. Sandy had an 18-year-old son whose name is Justin Beck. Mark was Justin's stepdad. They lived in a one-story ranch-style home with an attached garage. This is a very common style of home in Ohio. They're cheap to build. A lot of them have the same floor plan, which basically you walk through the front door or into a living room. There will be a kitchen off the living room with a back door in the kitchen. There's a hallway that leads to three bedrooms and a bathroom. In the kitchen, there's a small space for a laundry area and sometimes a partial bathroom. The Cates home is on Corwin Road on the south part of Waynesville. The houses on Corwin Road are not all bunched together like most of them are. Each house on the road have a de- Mark and Sandy had gotten married in 2010, and it appeared as though they had a good family life going on. On Tuesday afternoon, January 28th, 2014, Mark had come home from work around 3.30 p.m. Mark had noticed that the table had been moved in the kitchen and some rugs were missing. Mark did not call law enforcement at this time. Sometime after that, Sandy realized that a safe and a handgun were missing. Mark and Sandy must have added everything up that was missing and both finally realized that something was wrong. They called 911. 
Mark and Sandy also tried to call their 18-year-old son, Justin, back. They soon found out that Justin's phone was there at the house, which made them wonder where Justin was at. Law enforcement showed up at the home expecting to look into a call about a possible home burglary. They found out that Justin was also missing, and there didn't look to be any kind of forced entry into the home. Law enforcement started to investigate what happened at the Kate's home, and were looking for Justin. Sometime on the day of the 28th, law enforcement had talked to one of the neighbors, giving the police officers a tip about a suspicious car that had been at the home earlier that day. That neighbor had given a description of the vehicle. Mark had recognized the description of the vehicle. Two individuals were at the house the day before to see Justin, because it was a friend of Justin's from the past. This friend was Austin Myers. Myers and the individual he was with was in that vehicle that matched the description that the neighbor gave to law enforcement. Law enforcement would start the search for that suspicious vehicle and the young man named Austin Myers. And they were also out looking for Justin back. After 12 a.m. on January 29th, Warren County Sheriff's Department would get a call from another law enforcement agency. This law enforcement agency had spotted this suspicious vehicle and they had detained Austin Myers at the home. Clayton Police Department spotted this suspicious vehicle at a home in Clayton, Ohio. Myers was also at this house. This wasn't Austin Myers' house. A young man by the name of Timothy Mosley lived at the house, and the suspicious vehicle belonged to Mosley. Clayton, Ohio is in Montgomery County, which is the next county north of Warren County. Clayton is on the north part of Dayton, Ohio. It's not a big community. I've been to Clayton before, and to be honest with you, I didn't even know that Clayton had their own police department. I drive from Waynesville in Warren County. Clayton police officers detained Myers at the home while they contacted Warren County Sheriff's detectives. Warren County needed to question Myers. Austin Myers was taken to the Clayton Police Department. Warren County detective Clayton. Around 2 a.m. in the morning, the detective walked into the holding cell at the Clayton Police Department to find Myers partially laying down trying to sleep. The detective first noticed that Myers was a skinny, white, 18-year-old with medium-length dark hair. Myers had on blue jeans, a white sweatshirt, and a black zip-up hoodie. Myers' young face looks as though it was too young to even grow facial hair. The detective asked Myers if Myers knew anything about the home in Waynesville and about the safe and handgun that was missing. They also asked why Mosley's car had been spotted at the home by a witness. Myers told the detectives that he didn't know anything about a missing safe or a gun. The detective asked Myers if he knew anything about the disappearance of Justin back. Myers denied knowing anything about what might have happened to Justin. After the detective questioned Myers, Myers was taken back to Mosley's house. This is when law enforcement took Timothy Mosley, the owner of the suspicious vehicle, to the Clayton Police Department for questioning. Timothy Mosley was 19 years old. Mosley had a bigger build to his body than Myers. Mosley had short, dark hair. Mosley had on a black sweatshirt, gray sweatpants, a camouflage jacket, and a red winter hat. The detectives asked Mosley the same basic questions that they had asked Myers. Mosley denied knowing anything about a missing safe or gun. Mosley told the detectives that he didn't know where Justin Back could be and that he only knew Justin because of Myers. The detective finished up his questioning and then Mosley was taken back to his house. I have to question how law enforcement handled the My question is why wasn't the two men taken into questioning at the same time? They knew that they had to question Myers, but the suspicious vehicle didn't belong to Myers, it belonged to Timothy Mosley. So wouldn't there be a moment where one would say, hey, they both need to come to the department at the same time, but in different rooms? 
I say this because it gives time for one or the other to dispose of any evidence that they might have. Then after Mosley's interview, they were both back at the house together, so that gives them time to get their stories straight with each other. This could have given them a window of opportunity to try to run. Now I've watched and read a lot of stuff on this case. Everything I've read says that law enforcement had gone back to Mosley's house and Myers and Mosley was then arrested and questioned again. And everything that I've read doesn't give a reason why that the detectives went back the second time. The reason why I bring this up is that I almost recorded this episode without even knowing why law enforcement had made the decision to go back and bring Myers and Mosley back to the police station. As I thought I was finally done with laying out the episodes on Myers and Mosley, I find a court appeal document on Myers' behalf, and there was something in that court document that I had honestly not seen anywhere else in any article or any video that I went through for this case. There was a third person at Timothy Mosley's house on the night of January 29th. In this court document, this person is only referred to by one name, Zinni. Now, I think that's pronounced right, but it is spelled Z-E-N-N-I-E. -E. And I'm pretty sure that this guy's first name is Logan, and that's what I'm going to refer to him by. Law enforcement had taken Logan to the Clayton Police Department after they had dropped off Mosley. I have no kind of description or age on Logan. It is stated, though, that Logan was questioned by the detective. It doesn't say what Logan told the detective. Whatever Logan had told the detective led to the arrest of Myers and Mosley. The detective would question Myers and Mosley again. This time their story started to change. The interviews were recorded by video. The detective started with Myers first. Myers' story was that he was at Justin's house and he had been there at the house when things had, had gone bad. Myers said that he didn't do anything, though. He blamed what happened on Mosley. I don't know if this is normal or not, but the two holding cells that Myers and Mosley were in were side by side. Apparently the walls or something were thin enough that Mosley had heard what Myers had told the detectives. So when the detectives had gone in and questioned Mosley again, Mosley was ready to tell the detective what really happened. Back in and confronted Myers with what Mosley had confessed to, Myers' story changed a little again, but Myers still denied knowing what Mosley had planned. The detectives sat and listened to two different versions of what happened at the Gates home on the day and the day before January 28th, 2014. I'm going to try to lay this all out as to how Mosley had confessed and testified to. Then after I talk about the chain of events to what happened, I will talk a little bit more about Myers' interview. The reason for this is that I believe that the courts and law enforcement believe Mosley's confession to how things had really gone down. Myers wasn't being completely honest about his part in what happened on January 28th. This all got started on January 27th, 2014, which was on a Monday. Mosley had said that Myers had overslept that Monday morning and had missed his very first day of a new job. I don't know how badly they needed money, but apparently they needed some money fast. Clayton is around Dayton and some other areas where Myers and Mosley could have gotten jobs. On that Monday morning, after missing his first day of work, Myers asked Mosley if he wanted to make some money. Mosley said that he did want to make some money. Mosley said that Myers talked about robbing a drug dealer, or possibly and Myers talked about a friend of his. Myers' friend was Justin Back. Myers said that Justin's stepdad kept a safe at the house the safe was usually left open. Myers told Mosley that there had to be at least $20,000 in the safe. A home invasion would be easier than targeting a drug dealer or bank. 
All they had to do was go in, take the safe, and leave. Mosley and Myers got into the car and left Clayton. Mosley was driving and Myers was given directions. Mosley said that he figured out that Myers had made up his mind about what they were going to do as they got closer to Waynesville. When they got to the Gates house, they realized that Justin was there. Myers and Mosley decided not to go through with their plan. They did go up and knock on the door, and Justin let them inside the house. Justin Beck was an 18-year-old graduate from Waynesville High School. He was a decent-looking young man with a bus cut hair cut. Justin was looking to make his way into the United States Navy. Now here is a very interesting point. Justin and Myers had been friends in the 7th and 8th grade in middle school. Shortly after that, Justin's mom had made the two stop hanging around each other. Myers would eventually move away from Waynesville. It had been six years since Justin and Myers had seen each other, which brings up the question, what made Myers think that a safe would still be inside the house and be filled with $20,000? So Myers and Mosley had showed up at Justin's house around noon, and Justin, even though he hadn't seen Myers for years, had let them inside the house. Myers and Mosley stayed at the house for about 20 minutes, and then they had left. But they didn't leave Waynesville. Myers and Mosley went to the Waynesville Public Library. It was at this library that Myers and Mosley discussed how they could get the money. This is where Myers first brought up the ideal of killing Justin back. As I put this episode together, there's one thing I still don't have an answer to. Why did Myers and Mosley want this money so badly? There has to be a reason why they were so desperate for money that Myers would think about killing a childhood friend. Have not seen or heard anything about drugs being the reason for the need of money. I did consider that though because they did think about robbing a drug dealer. Most people who are desperate enough to rob somebody for money don't really consider robbing a drug dealer as their first option. Myers and Mosley's first plan on how to kill Justin was by a fatal injection. Myers had suggested that they could use cold medicine. They had gone to a store to buy what they needed. They got what they needed, and Myers even got some kind of poison called bug wash or something. And they even made it all the way up to cash register. But Myers' card was declined. They tried to get money from the store's ATM, but the card was declined again. After leaving the store without what they needed, Myers directed Mosley to a pharmacy. Myers went inside and asked the clerk for syringes. Myers waited a little bit in line, but eventually left without them. Once again, Myers and Mosley did not get what they need. Myers and Mosley had plenty enough time just to change their minds and go home, but they did not. They had gone back to Justin's house. Myers and Mosley sat down and watched a movie with Justin. After Mark, Justin's stepdad, had got home, Mark sat down and watched a movie with the three of them. It wasn't until Mark and Justin needed to go somewhere that Myers and Mosley left the Kate's home. Myers and Mosley went to a McDonald's in Waynesville. While at this McDonald's, the two tried to figure out what they could do. Mosley had suggested that they could go back to the house at that moment while Mark and Justin were gone. Myers didn't want to because who knew when Mark and Justin would return. Myers and Mosley left McDonald's and picked up a friend, Logan. The three of them drove past Justin's house. Then they picked up another friend named Cole and drove back to Mosley's house in Clayton. Once back at Mosley's house, Myers and Mosley went upstairs to Mosley's bedroom. Logan and Cole stayed downstairs watching television. Myers and Mosley continued thinking of how they could get the safe. Mosley had written down the ideals to their new plan in a little notebook. They planned to use a wire to choke Justin to death. They could look like Justin took the safe and ran. Then they would dump Justin's body in a remote area. Myers had brought up the idea of killing Mark also. They could make it look as though Mark killed Justin and then took off. But Mosley didn't agree with him. 
that would be just too much work. Then Myers and Mosley left the house and went to Lowe's in Trotwood, Ohio. Logan and Cole stayed at Mosley's house. Trotwood is south of Clayton next to Dayton in Montgomery County. Myers and Mosley by a and two metal cleats. Once those three items are assembled, it makes a choke wire. Myers and Mosley went back to the house and back upstairs to Mosley's bedroom. Logan and Cole are still downstairs. Myers and Mosley start to assemble the choke wire, but Logan walked into the room and there wasn't any time for Myers and Mosley to hide the stuff. Mosley has said that he doesn't remember what they had told Logan, but for some reason Logan had put the choke wire together for Myers and Mosley. With the choke wire assembled, Myers and Mosley plan to carry out their plan the following day. I will take a moment to explain a choke wire. A choke wire is a piece of wire with something attached to both ends. Once this is wrapped around something and you pull the handles on the ends in opposite directions, the wire tightens up. And I also want to know how well someone sleeps at night after planning to kill somebody, especially a friend. That would be a long night. The next morning, Tuesday, January 28th, Myers and Mosley had gone out to get more things for their plan. Mosley had suggested that they get ammonia and septic enzymes. They thought that it would get rid of any DNA evidence. Apparently, Mosley liked watching crime shows. They went to a store northeast of Dayton to buy the ammonia and septic tank cleaner. Then Mosley and Myers drove to Waynesville to Justin's house. And I want to stop here for a second. And I want to ask, where are they getting the money for the ammonia and the septic tank cleaner and the steel wire? I mean, they're wanting to rob somebody for money. Myers' card was declined to purchase this stuff. It's just a question that popped up in my head while doing this. Myers wanted to be at Justin's house at a certain time. The two of them actually stopped at a store to walk around just to waste time. They even stopped somewhere to get gas in the car. Then they drove past Justin's house several different times and finally pulled into the driveway at 1 p.m. Myers knocked on the door and Justin let the two inside the house. They talked for a while and Justin was nice enough to ask Myers if Myers wanted something to drink. Myers said that he did and Justin and Myers went into the kitchen and that's when Mosley followed them. Justin opened up the refrigerator door and leaned in to get Myers something to drink. As Justin was straightening back up, Mosley put the choke wire over Justin's head and tried to wrap the Myers stepped in front of Justin and held Justin while Mosley used the choke wire. Justin put up a fight and the three of them fell on the kitchen floor. Myers noticed that the choke wire wasn't around Justin's neck. The wire had got caught in Justin's chin. Justin was trying to talk to his attackers. Justin kept asking why. Why are you doing this to me? Myers told Justin it would be alright. It would all be over soon. Myers told Mosley that the wire was caught in Justin's chin. Mosley freaked out and pulled out his pocket knife and stabbed Justin. This is when Myers took a hold of the choke wire. Myers was sitting on the kitchen floor with his back up against the wall, and he made sure that the choke wire was around Justin's neck. Then Myers held Justin down with the choke wire. Justin was basically sitting in between Myers' leg wire. Justin was stabbed 21 times. After Justin was dead, Myers and Mosley started to search the house for the safe. After Justin was dead, Myers and Mosley searched the house for the safe. They had found the safe in a closet in the master bedroom. There was a problem though, the safe was locked. While they were searching for the safe, Myers had found a 9mm handgun and some ammo. Myers loaded the gun. Myers and Mosley had gone back to the kitchen to clean up the crime scene. They used ammonia and rugs to clean up the blood. They also used some towels that they could find. Myers and Mosley wrapped up Justin's body in a blanket and then took Justin's body outside to Mosley's car. 
They put Justin's body into the trunk of the car. Then Myers and Mosley had gone back inside of the house. They went through the house to grab the safe, jewelry, and some credit cards. They put some of Justin's clothes and some of his belongings into a bag and a laundry basket. They also put the bloody rags and rugs into a bag. They took everything out to Mosley's car and left the house before 2 p.m. One thing I learned while reading the court appeal document on Meyer's behalf, there was something that stood out about Mosley's car. The Gray Cavalier didn't have a back window. The back window was replaced with a piece of plastic. Things didn't go as they had planned, but they kept their composure. They was going to get that $20,000 that was inside that safe no matter what. None of this shows good judgment. Okay, so you want to rob a house. Punishment for robbing a house. This makes me ask myself, was there more motive behind all of this than just the safe and the $20,000 that might have been inside? Someone who wants to break into a house and rob it usually wants no one to be home. So why didn't Myers and Mosley wait until no one was home? Myers and Mosley drove from Waynesville to Clayton, Ohio. At some point, Mosley was getting paranoid and started thinking that they were being followed. They stayed on back roads that didn't have much traffic. Mosley found a remote spot and stopped the car. Mosley got out of the car to look the car over. Mosley wanted to make sure there wasn't any blood on the car. That would be a scary ride. Most people would get paranoid over little things. Most people would never take a 45 minute drive with a body in the trunk of a car. While they were stopped at that remote spot, Myers and Mosley searched the belongings of Justin's that they had taken from the house. They found Justin's wallet and there was about $100 inside of the wallet, which they took. Myers and Mosley had made it to Mosley's house in Clayton, Ohio. Myers had gone inside the house and went into the bathroom. Myers washed the blood off his arms. While Myers was inside of the bathroom, Mosley was bringing things inside of the house. They both carried the safe upstairs to Mosley's bedroom. After they were done with all that, Myers and Mosley both changed their clothes. They still had Justin's body in the trunk of the car. The next step was to dispose of the body. Getting rid of a body is no easy task. I'm surprised they didn't get rid of the body before they went back to Clayton. Mosley said that he knew of an area that they could dispose of Justin's body. Mosley knew a little town called West Alexandria, Ohio. That got my attention. I know that area. West Alexandria is about 30 minute drive from Clayton. Myers and Mosley found a spot on Fudge Road, which is south of West Alexandria, just north of the village of Gratis in Preble County. A little known fact about Fudge Road in Preble County. Fudge Road has always had rumors about it. It is said that Crybaby Bridge is on this road. I believe every state has some kind of haunted tale about a Crybaby Bridge. But that's not all. They say there's a lady who lives on the road and she owns much of the land. If she sees you on the road, she will chase after you. Sounds a little far out there, doesn't it? But that's not all there is to Fudge Road. There is a house on this road that people say was custom made for a family of little people. Smaller doorways and windows and all that good stuff. Somehow this family dies and the house stays abandoned. This is a real house. I have seen it. Now there has been a fence put around this house. This is where people say that the witch raises demon hogs for her satanic witch oven sacrifices. I know this all sounds crazy, but I bring this up because in 2012 the bridge was shut down and never rebuilt. You cannot get to one side of the fudge road to another. I know this, I've seen the bridge. The road itself was shut down to traffic some time after that. Some say because of the attention that the bridge got and the witch didn't want all that attention. I wish I knew what road they had taken to get to Fudge Road because then I would know what side of the bridge they were on. Fudge Road is not a very long road. When the body was found, 
The location wasn't given out to public. Somewhere on Fudge Road, they spotted a log out in a field. Mosley drove his car into the field and stopped 20 feet from the log. There was snow on the ground. Myers and Mosley get Justin's body from the trunk of the car. They laid the body behind the log. The body was still partially wrapped in a blanket. Myers poured ammonia and septic enzymes over the body. He did this thinking that it would eat away some of the evidence that would be on the body. The body was still clothed and partially wrapped in a blanket. The ammonia and septic enzymes didn't work like Myers had hoped. Myers, for some reason, still hadn't had enough. Myers wanted to shoot the body of Justin back. Mosley had gone to the car and got the gun. Mosley gave the gun to Myers. Myers fired two rounds into the lifeless body of Justin. Myers had tried to fire a third shot, but the gun jammed. Myers cleared the jam, and the unfired round fell to the ground. Law enforcement would later find that unfired round. I would like to know why someone would find it necessary to shoot a lifeless body. Was there some rage behind of all of this that no one knows about? After they were done disposing of Justin's body, Myers seemed to still want more. Myers had suggested that they go back to Waynesville, Ohio. They could kill Mark, Justin's stepdad. They could make it look like Mark killed Justin and then took off. This to me sounds a little like bloodlust. He got a little taste of blood. Murder. Thought they were going to get away with it. And Myers wanted more. They decided not to go back to Wayne's Northeast to a city called Brookville. They stopped at a park in Brookville and found a dumpster. They disposed of Justin's laptop in the dumpster. Then they drove 10 minutes east to the city of Inglewood, which is next to Clayton, Ohio. While they were in Inglewood, they bought a crowbar. It was time to go back to Mosley's and crack the safe. It was time for them to get that $20,000. Once they were back at Mosley's house, they were successful with opening the safe, but there was no $20,000. They found some loose change, ammo, paperwork, some gun accessories, and a few other things. What made Myers think that there would be $20,000 in that safe? They took some items out of the safe that they thought that they could sell. They went outside to the back of Mosley's house. They burned paperwork, bags of evidence, and bloody clothes in a fire pit. Myers and Mosley loaded up what they thought were valuable and the safe into Mosley's car. They then drove to Logan's house. Logan let Myers and Mosley store the stuff that they had took from Justin at Logan's house. Then they took about a 20 minute drive from Tip City which is north of Dayton, Ohio. While they were in Tip City, they threw the safe in the river. I'm starting to wonder what all Logan did know about this savage robbery and murder. After going to Tip City, Myers and Mosley had gone back to Mosley's house. Sometime on January 29th, Logan had come over to Mosley's house. Then Clayton Police Department spotted this suspicious vehicle. I think this is where I need to talk a little bit about Austin Myers' confession. I've already said that Myers' first interview, Myers denied knowing anything about the home invasion or what happened to Justin Beck. Myers' story changed in his second interview. Myers said that he had been in there when Mosley stabbed Justin. But Myers said that he didn't know anything about it. It wasn't planned. Myers said that he only planned to hang out with Justin. That was it. Myers denied shooting Justin's lifeless body. The detective would interview Myers again. Parts of Myers' story changed again. Myers admitted to shooting Justin's lifeless body. He admitted to knowing that the steel cable and the metal cleats were bought to the symbol a choke wire. Myers denied what Mosley had said about Myers holding back Justin with a choke wire. Basically, it comes down to whose story does law enforcement want to believe, or does the evidence point. 
how much evidence could be left. Evidence was burned, had ammonia poured onto it, put into a dumpster, and thrown into a river. I could be wrong for saying this. Sometimes I believe law enforcement leads the first one who takes a plea deal. First one who takes a plea deal isn't always honest or gives the whole complete story. In this case, Timothy Mosley, the first one to use the choke wire, the one who stabbed Justin back to death, takes a plea deal and receives a life sentence. A part of Mosley's plea deal, Mosley had to testify against Myers at Myers' trial. Mosley helped lead law enforcement to different pieces of evidence. Law enforcement had found the notebook in which Myers and Mosley had written down parts of their plan. Prosecutor had the choke wire that was used. They also had video evidence of Myers and Mosley going into the stores to buy the things that they needed. The evidence against Myers was overwhelming. Myers was convicted of aggravated murder, aggravated robbery, abuse of a corpse, and a few more other charges. Mosley was convicted of the same exact charges. Mosley's lawyers said that if it wasn't for Myers, Mosley would have never done something like that. I watched a video of Mosley's court testimony. I have to say I did not see or hear any kind of remorse in Mosley. I also watched a video of Myers pleading for his life as the jury would decide his fate. I did not see or hear any real remorse in Myers and what would have happened if they were not arrested. Myers was sentenced to death and became the youngest person to sit on Ohio's death row at the age of 19. I have to admit that I don't always agree with the death penalty. A case like this, a harsh punishment needs to be handed down. But should they have both gotten the same punishment? I do have a problem with a death sentence being handed down to a 19 year old going inside of any prison at that young of an age is like walking into hell on earth. Every minute of Austin Myers' adult life will be behind bars. Austin Myers is 26 years old now and has less than a year to live. Myers is scheduled for execution in July 2022. Now, after all this, I ask myself, do I still think a death sentence might be too much for a 19-year-old, given what happened? I would still have to say yes. What happened to Justin Beck was horrible. Justin was killed over a safe that didn't even belong to him. Justin should have never died. I just think a life sentence would have been punishment enough for a 19-year-old. I know that there are people out there who disagree with me. There are people who want the death penalty to be carried out on Austin Myers. All of this received national attention. Some people did not agree with the difference in punishments for Myers and Mosley. Justin's back parents wanted to do something to help prevent senseless murders. The House of Lawmakers passed a new law this new law was called Justin's Law. Justin's Law was named after Justin Back. This law would increase punishment for murderers. So let's say someone gets a life sentence and they have a chance at parole. Let's say after 20 to 30 years. Under this new law, Justin's Law, a person wouldn't be up for parole till let's say 25 to 30 years and so on. A person will have to serve more of their sins before they could get paroled. This new law would increase the punishment for premeditated murder. It would also increase punishment for children younger than 18 who commit murder, but keep the death penalty off the table. I think it is a good thing that there is an increase in punishment for murderers, but I don't believe it's going to stop the problem. At the time, this new law was coming out. The Defender's Office was opposed to stricter sentences. The United States Sentencing Commission defines a life sentence as 39 years. You might be wondering what would cause the death penalty to be considered in a murder case. The death penalty is an option for things like murder during a robbery, 
burglary, kidnapping, or rape, assassinations, and murder for hire, but not premeditated murder. I might be wrong for saying this, but I think the state should consider not giving a death penalty to anyone under the age of 21 years old. Now I come across an article. This article is basically just talking about their pen pal. And this person's pen pal is Austin Myers. It has always been a common thing for death row inmates to have pen pals. I was surprised to come across something like this though. I bring up Austin Myers pen pal blogger article because I believe it could possibly give a perspective of a possible mindset Myers could have while sitting on death row. This article was written by Abigail Moss and was published in February of 2016. In this, Abigail writes that Myers seems intelligent and has a very neat handwriting. They talked about family and friends the general stuff that happens in life. They talk about the theory of space and the physiological implications of fear. Then most of the time they just talk about their favorite bands. Myers signs his letters with peace or the words live life. If anyone would like to check out this article I will have a link for it in the episode description. There's a lot more to their article than what I have talked about. If you're wanting, the physiological implication of fear is basically just the basic theories behind what causes fear and why we feel it. I checked out some of the comments that were left on Abigail's article. There aren't many. There are some hateful ones from people who disagree with the article. The first comment I read, though, caught my attention. The writer of the comment uses the screen name, My Opinion, in all caps. This person claims to have known Austin. The person wrote that Austin's mom was a sweet lady and that Austin was a good kid growing up. They grew up in a small town, a very trusting community. While I'm on the subject of people's comments, I would say that most of the comments I have seen about Myers are from people who think Myers got what he deserved. Whenever a life sentence or death sentence is handed down, there will always be court appeals. By law, it is the convicted person's right to do so. It didn't take long for Myers' lawyer to file an appeal. In November 2014, 11 months after the murder, the Ohio Supreme Court put a state on the execution of Austin Myers. Basically what this means is that the state's highest court ruled that no date could be set while Miles' court appeal was pending. This made me wonder, how soon could a person be executed after they were sentenced to death? I found something that said it could take up to 16 years for a death row inmate to be put to death. If a convicted person doesn't appeal the sentence at all, it could happen as quick as 6 months. It is about how long an inmate wants to fight for their life. In May of 2018, Ohio's highest court voted to uphold the death sentence that was given to Myers. Myers argued that he had never touched a murder weapon, the knife, among 16 other issues. The prosecutor argued that Myers targeted his friend and restrained his friend while he was being stabbed. The prosecutor said that Timothy Mosley was just Austin's weapon of choice. One of the arguments for the appeal was that Timothy Mosley the one who stabbed Justin back 21 times, had only gotten a life sentence. Another argument was that Mosley admitted that Myers did not know that Mosley had the pocket knife on him. It was a part of the plan. The Supreme Court justices wrote that things might not have gone as planned, but they were planned. Prosecutors said that Mosley earned his plea deal. Mosley chose to cooperate early on Mosley gave evidence that upheld his story of what happened. And I will say this, that the prosecutor and others have admitted that if Mosley would have never testified against Myers, Myers probably wouldn't be sitting on death row right now. Now we are in the year of 2021. In April of 2021, Myers' lawyers files another appeal on Myers' behalf. 
In July of 2021, Myers lawyers filed for a motion to continue the stay of Myers' execution till all of his appeals have been exhausted. The courts have granted the continuous stay of the execution. So this means that even though Myers has an execution date in July of 2022, if his appeals last longer than that, then he cannot be executed in July of 2022. There was also a ruling allowing Myers to present new evidence in his appeal case. If you remember what I said before, it could take up to 16 years for a death row inmate to face execution because of their court appeals. This is 2021. Said it has been seven years since Myers was sentenced to death. In 2022, it will be eight years. So Myers still could have a few years left. If he wins an appeal, he could spend the rest of his life in prison. Myers is 26 years old now. If he loses whatever appeals that he has left, then he only has till they run out. Austin Myers is sitting on death row in Chillicothe Correctional Institution. The same death row where Willie Flip Williams from episode one of Murders in Ohio sat until 2015 till Williams was taken to Lucasville to be executed. 2015 would be about the time Myers would be making his way to death row. Imagine yourself being 19 years old and sitting on death row with somebody like Willie Williams. If you don't remember Willie Williams, or you didn't listen to the episode, go back to the very first episode of this podcast and check it out. Another person sitting on death row that I've talked about is Aaron Lawson. Basically, any male who is sentenced to death in Ohio is going to be at Chilla Coffee on death row till that final day when they are taken to Lucasville to be put to death. Timothy Mosley is 27 now. He is serving his life sentence in Ross Correctional Institution. Mosley has balked up a little bit and is sporting a new big neck tattoo that wasn't there during his trial. Mosley has no chance of parole. In 2015, Mosley tried to appeal his aggravated murder charge. He said he was unsure about what he would plead guilty to at the time. The court denied Mosley's appeal. Myers and Mosley are now practically neighbors. Myers is at Chillicothe Correctional Institution. Mosley is at Ross Correctional. The two prisons are directly across the street from one another in Chillicothe. Mark Gates now works at Lowe's Department Store. Sandy still lives in the same house on Corwin Road in Waynesville. She says Justin Spirit fills the house and she talks to him daily. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Murderers in Ohio. This podcast and music was written by... We got the devil on the road and 